Hello and welcome back to uh, Cutting with Devs. We're, 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 I'm playing Cud with Brian Bucklew. How are you Hello. doing? Hello. Doing fine. <laughs> nice. Fantastic. Um, so we covered um, what it's like working with, um, you know, other people. You've, you've grown since uh, the beginning of Cud. And um, I wanted to go through ambitions. Ambitions for Cud. Childhood fiction, which you still love and has inspired you. I think we covered that pretty extensively. We did influences. Yeah, we talk, yeah, we talk a lot about influences. Um, I mean, we talk a lot about media influences um, and like roguelike influences. Obviously, like a big stew of influences when in the caves of Cud. Yeah, so, I mean, and, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit off, off camera as well. Like, there's... Uh, Cud just seems like a huge hot pot of many, many different influences, um, yeah. which I think is like, you know, I, th I th honestly think some of the best media is influenced by just a ridiculous amount of stuff until it becomes its own brew. Um, I'm just trying to figure out where I'm supposed to be heading next. I should be hitting Q. Oh, we're going to Great Gate. I've had um, a historically awful, awful time getting to grit gate it is somehow um one of the simplest quests that kills me the most often it's 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 an easy moment to get over over confident because you you're you're definitely strong enough to beat the opening dungeons but it ratchets up the difficulty just a little bit and yep. you can you can also get lost in the jungles there which can be a little bit of a difficulty spike and I have a, I have like a, I, I don't know. I, I've mentioned a lot my disdain for the desert canyon, uh, more so than the jungle, honestly. Like, yeah. canyons, it's, it's, the worst. Just you don't like the layout, or they're they're deadly to you for whatever reason. Or? So it's it's a combination of a uh, play style and uh, a mind trap that I get myself in, which is. Um, desert canyons are very easy, at least after you've, like, uh, surmounted the very initial difficulty curve of Caves of Cud. Yeah. So yeah. I never take wayfinding for desert canyons. I see. So I get lost in desert canyons constantly. Yeah, and they're, they're, they're tough to get unlost then because you're so limited on the, on the exits from them. You're yeah. kind of trapped in these windy tunnels. Yeah, and that's the other part. That is it the canyon desert, um or hills are they're really difficult to get on lost because you can't like get to the edge of a screen reliably yeah, yeah that's right so you just you just kind of have to like mull around and okay i regain my bearings thank goodness and i mean i have died it's it's cost me games because i'm like <laughs> i'm like yeah oh, the desert canyons should be fine no salt hoppered to death slug snout there it is yeah no no place in cut is truly safe it's true okay um, I think last time I was trying to do historic sites, but I'm, I've actually been cursed with some fairly cruel historic sites. So let's uh, let me see. Yeah, they have, a, they have a pretty wide range of difficulty compared to the compared to the main quest. They're a bit of a an advanced or at least intermediate thing to do as a player. So you can always end up in a site that's just a bunch of chrome pyramids or. <laughs> who knows what like pretty much anything can show up as as cultists at the edge of the probability space it does seem to me like um there is i don't know if this is a recent thing or uh or not but it seems did i just walk by yeah i did okay well that's nightmarish um there's a slumbering so oh, and good they're they are awake now we are in hell okay um, oh that's not good at all yeah no that's that's awful for me um uh, well, I think, uh, I think I will sprint away. I don't I think don't that that will save me, but. You gotta, you gotta get out of charge range. Oh, um, back to sleep. There you go. Did they go back to sleep? Yeah. Oh yeah, falls back to sleep. Asleep. I didn't even know that was an option, to be honest. Yeah, they don't stay awake all that long. They're pretty sleepy. They're very, they're sleepy lads. All right, there's still hostiles nearby. I am, I'm in danger, but I'm not as in immediate danger. Um, all right, so 
Given more time and resources, what is an extravagant frill you'd love to add to CUD that isn't currently feasible? I have a stipulation. This would be a feature that you don't think will ever be feasible to add currently. Like, oh, I, I mean, I don't think that about anything. I think it, like having gotten this far in CUD, what what what's impossible truly? Not much. I think I think what's I can say things that are out of reach currently. Um, like I think I think the the way CUD looks and plays right now is exactly the aesthetic we were going for when we set out. It's not ASCII anymore, but it's it has the density of ASCII. It refers to ASCII in a way. But I think CUD could be made more accessible with with higher fidelity presentation, right? It wouldn't even have to be that much higher fidelity, but um, you know, I think I think you could give it bigger tiles, right? Like you do 32 by 32 or 64 by 64 and give it pseudo 3D, give it some lighting, um, maybe give it more animation. But that's, you know, that's a that's a multi-million dollar project for the amount of contents in Caves of Cud. Yeah, because um, you're, you're talking about a ridiculous amount of tiles that need to, that would need to be updated. Yeah, yeah, you, we, we would need some kind of animation rig for creatures that, that has arbitrary numbers of limbs and... Um, uh, you know, it it would just be people would want to see all their equipment on their on their little arbitrary doll, doll, paper doll, and that you know there's an awful lot of equipment and an awful lot of ways your paper doll can be arbitrarily mutated and cut. And so, I don't think that's infeasible. I don't think that that's impossible. But it is it is a big build. That said, like I think, I think it might be commercially worthwhile even as expensive as it is to make cut accessible to that many players maybe it would be something we would do down the road if those kind of resources became available to us i think localization is something we'd really like to do but it's very very hard for a game like caves of cud yeah i've, um, I've seen a i've seen a couple of um i i, I don't know if it's your tweets or kaylin's tweets floating around about how it's really difficult to translate cud because of like it's it's kind of a semi pun based universe, but also because of the way strings of like sentences are, are put together, um, it would be difficult to kind of make that like coherent in, in other languages. Yeah, the the way most software is translated is that you have a big basically spreadsheet of strings that are every string that's in the software is in this big spreadsheet. And someone or a group of someone's will go through and one for one translate each of these strings into into different languages. And then when you run the software, it picks up the right file that has the right set of strings and just uses those replacements. And it's often imperfect, but still good enough to get no. the point across. Caves of Cud, almost all of this text that you're seeing is generated procedurally based on the situation, based on the pronouns of the thing, based on the subjective identity of the thing all of these sentences can can mutate in different ways and that's a very specific set of gra grammatic rules for english and so to to localize it into other languages you need to be able to get those grammatic rules those procedural grammatic rules which are quite complicated every week we're we've got bugs for specific corner cases of these grammatic rules and import the rules of of another language um, and this is kind of an unsolved research problem. There's a few ways you could approach it, um, but it's 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 certainly not solved. Um, you could do post de facto translation, generate it all in English, and run it through some kind of some kind of on the fly translator like a Google Translate or one of the new LLM based translators um, after the fact. But I, n nobody has really done that commercially, so it's not something that. That that's trivial, um, and certainly not anything we have the bandwidth inside the team to explore before 1.0 at least. It's, it's interesting well, to me like yeah. that almost seems like the most unfeasible thing. <laughs> it's it would be it it like graphics is just a it's I don't think it's impossible I but but it is it is hard like that is a hard problem. Um, that said, Caves of Cut is you know we'd love to make the game playable, especially in, uh, like in, in Europe, a lot of people speak English as a second language. So cut is, is sort of accessible, but especially in a lot of Asiatic countries, 
the English is not as common as a second language, and SoCut is just not not accessible. And we'd love to make it accessible to those players. That would be great. Uh, and we get a lot of players asking for that. We just it's it's just a hard, expensive problem. That's pretty interesting. I wonder, um, in terms of like going going back to graphics for a sec, I, I wonder if like just a mod to to just <laughs> this, this is probably, you know ignorant person that knows nothing of coding um, speaks for a moment um, would just like make caves of code voxel based, <laughs> just like turn yeah, well, turn every sprite into voxels. You can, yeah. I mean, you can do that. Um, you can you can take the what's rendered here and project it into a, a more complex space uh, and in fact what's going on here is that i did that for ascii i took i took the ascii output and added some additional data and including the tiles that are presented right. and later additional data that's like oh the the you know that certain animations are happening and in fact i'm just bumping the like the uh, the original text square layout squares around to make those animations happen um so that layering has already happened from the old original true ascii console version to today um in order to to get the tile based presentation why is the stair attacking? yeah <laughs> oh there, there's a creature on it or there was there's there's some funny funny things happening there that i've never seen before actually the stairs were doing a jig you could see right then exactly what I'm doing, which is just pushing the... Briefly pushing the actual sprite that holds the character or tile around in order to get those animations working. <laughs> That's really good. Um, I mean, this is, this is probably not... Well, we can go through it, but I think this is pretty obvious at this point, but... Uh, is there a feature you would like to see removed like one that i outside of maybe some of the inner uh, input stuff that i know that you uh are and and uh, narf are working hard to you know kind of um make redundant or at least like phase out outside of input stuff is there anything that you think no longer really fits that maybe people have gone gotten attached to um I think, that, I think there's a lot of systems in the game that we would do differently if we were to, to build them now. Um, our like design capabilities and our aesthetics have, have evolved a lot over the time we've been building Caves of Cud. Um, and so, you know, I think I think the game is it has a bunch of combat systems that are like pretty sparse. The game ends up being pretty combat heavy in a way that isn't like all that interesting compared to the stuff that we we leaned into in the later years of the development right um it's it's there's nothing wrong with it i don't think it would need to be removed right it's definitely serves a purpose in in the second to second gameplay i think we would probably do it differently i think things like tinkering um are are incomplete compared to something we might do today but still was work perfectly fine right caves of cut is sort of a, a, a big cathedral that's been built up in layers and the old layers are basically made by entirely different people considering how old they were now but the rest of the systems are built on top of them and the whole thing stands up so you know i think i think no matter how inc incomplete or sort of sparse the individual systems are the system is built up organically in a way that makes them all play a role I do think we'd like to evolve some of them in the future um, if we get the chance, but I don't think any of that's mandatory for 1.0. I think a lot of the systems work fine. I'm getting this funny thing happen where my my lad just kind of dances. He, he is dancing in the slime. Yeah, he's, he's trying to get somewhere and slipping and then moving a different direction from that new location. Okay, so that's, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Oh, God, I feel like the slumberling has been woken up again, or at least a new one. Um, oh, and we've got slugs now. It's, okay. Um, I, I wouldn't say I've been taught this, but I, I've, I've, you know, held um, some kind of weird belief, I suppose, that, um, like, you're, uh, I, I'm a different person from the one I was 10 years ago. 
Um, and if I still respect that person, then I would want to keep the parts that they created. Like, you know, like I, I made and published a comic like 10 years ago. And I've often had the idea of like, well, you know, I, I still like that comic. Um, I wouldn't mind like redrawing it. But that seems to me in some ways, a, you know, maybe betrayal is too harsh a word, but it's like, you know, they, they worked hard on it. That's a different person and they worked hard on it. So I should respect the thing that they made and not try and remake it. Do you think that some of the no. same philosophy is like... I mean, I, I think I think for cut, it's just a matter of practicality. In some cases, we have gone back and remade the old stuff. We talked a little bit about Red Rock and Rust Wells, and I think the game's just simply better for having revisited those, those old layers where it really does impact the, the quality of the play experience. Um, like, I think if we had the time to go readdress every dungeon and then prove it to the same extent that would be great we just like <laughs> practically don't have time right like grid gate gr grid gate is like in the early game where we said like this is pretty imperfect if we if we sat down and did this again even in just a few weeks we could improve this experience quite a lot but we just have the rest of the game to make and the qual the quality of the adventure in grid gate is is adequate for the time being it's really uh, whereas Rust Wells and Red Rock just weren't, right? Like, they were below the bar where we we felt comfortable saying, yeah, this is really 1.0, right? Um, and so we, we revisited those. It's really funny because, like, um, you know, I, I think for a lot of people, you know, like, when you see a project or, or follow along with a project, uh, or any kind of, you know, in any medium um, that takes time, any kind of time um they can you can see how the pieces are being developed and like improving um yeah. like you know i follow a, a couple of uh different things that have like taken 10 to 15 to 20 years and it's like yeah i can see how it's developed and you know certain things have changed maybe certain things i i preferred when they were closer to the like the root of the project um but like it's it's still compelling to see something develop like that um but in the case of cud since it's developed not just like in layers but also chronologically like you you, you know you've the the later dungeons in cud have been added to the game as time has gone um it means that the new dungeons are not just like more advanced more difficult but like they're actually made with a new uh sense of of like kind of design philosophies, new new tools have been developed, new methods. Um, yeah, often the later you get in a game, the less polished and interesting the dungeons are. So so that the first ten percent of the game is just flawless, right? Meticulously crafted, and then sort of the middle of the game works, and then the last ten or twenty percent of the game, often the team is running out of time and budget, and it's <laughs> it's often. A thrown together sketch of, of what um what they expected um and caves of cut it is is almost the inverse of that where the earliest dungeons now with the exception of red rock and and rust wells are the roughest where our tooling our like our intellectual tooling and our technical tooling for doing procedural systems our interest and capability and in building interesting quests and social systems and all of those things our our technology and and design sensibility evolves dungeon after dungeon so that by the time you're in these final dungeons like tomb of the eaters the 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 whole design sensibility is is almost entirely different quite evolved um much more focused on storytelling than combat um and so so cud sort of presents the inversion of of the traditional uh, route of RPGs, and I do, I do think if we were to delete anything, like just cut it out, a lot of the, the simple size of many of the early dungeons were just inspired by original roguelikes, which were often twenty or thirty levels deep, and they're just too big, right? Like Bethesda, <laughs> Bethesda Sousa is way too many levels, right? Crickgate is probably too deep, right? They like, just, they don't need to be that big. It gets repetitive, and so I think, I think if we were to redo those dungeons we might pull 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 just the, the sheer number of levels you have to descend out a little bit and i don't think the game will lose anything for that i think the game's quite big enough even if you cut bethesda's size in half 
You know, I hear what you're saying and I respect your decision, but I also disagree. I think that Bethesda Seuss's length um, adds think, it, a lot of tension to it. Yeah, yeah. Like, you might, we might do that to have one dungeon that, 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 that like, oh, this is the long dungeon, right? Golgoth is a short, frantic dungeon. Maybe Bethesda is a real slog, right? But I yeah. think I, we didn't do that mindfully when we built Bethesda. And right. if we if we did do that, I think we would do it mindfully in that way, right? Like, this is the long dungeon. Get ready. This is an endurance test. Right. And if you did that, maybe bring in some other mechanics that really make it that 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 kind of endurance test, right? Like, other, other than just length. Um, but, right, like, try to try to mindfully build around that theme rather than just making dungeons that are big because they're big in other games we were playing at the time in 1999 or whatever. Right. And, you know, it's funny because, like, you know, I have, I have been asked, like, what do you think is the hardest dungeon? And my answer is probably Bethesda Sousa. Like, I, I don't think that any other dungeon, at least so far, and I haven't really gotten to experience the Moonstare as much um as any other anything else especially since it's been developed like i haven't experienced the full thing yet um it nothing just kind of holds a flame because bethesda susa sits in that like really uncomfortable part of the game where you you aren't fully developed yet you don't have your build together yet and you're just kind of like cobbling together and you you don't it's even kind of hard to gauge when you're ready because it could be harder than it, it appears so. Yeah, and I think that's right. Bethesda Susa is kind of the last dungeon where you haven't just ripped the game systems apart with your character yet. A after that, your character is starting to really ascend into a place that the game is in some ways just sort of mechanically broken, which is fine. That's the, sort of the fun part of the game, right? The fun part of games like Morrowind or Skyrim or Caves of God is the fact that we don't put you in a in a time boxed MMO your activities are going to take three and a half minutes kind of box you you can you can learn gain such mastery of the systems that you really control the game and after Bethesda Susa definitely after the Tomb of the Eaters um, Tomb of the Eaters you're probably still in that mechanical place still where you're a character but Tomb of the Eaters is simply a bit more of a, a narrative place um, than it is a combat focused place yeah, I think um, unless you're like picking fights with the, with some of the the higher level creatures, it, yeah. it's you can you can have a pretty easy time in in Tomb of the Eaters. Yeah, by the time in Tomb of the Eaters, you're sort of going through an ascent, um, in multiple in multiple terms, right? Like that's 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 sort of the moment where where the game the game is now open to your character at that level. You're if you if you're interested in that kind of thing, you really you really have pretty much infinite power um and so the the rest of the game is a lot about interrogating that and letting you have as much or as little of that power as you want right if you want like just a pure brute that's like kind of not broken the systems you can do that and there's there's combat challenges for you but we didn't want to make sort of ascended god characters descend through other like more 30 love 30 level dungeons right like the the rest of the game is more about intersecting the player and the storyline that's been going on now for so long that it's sort of been a store like a live service story told over a decade for people who have been plugged into it with new episodes coming out every three months or six months yeah i definitely got in a sense of like um like the the, the additional dungeons have been very expedited like it's felt very quick between like major story updates um, yeah this last this last window has we've been doing sort of business development um so it's been like six months or so since the moon's there which is probably the longest time we've gone between updates but we are we are now working on the sort of penultimate story beat um which will be followed by the final story beat so we're getting pretty close so just so I get it, got this straight. So after Moonster, there's going to be a, a a big story beat, and then another story beat, and that'll be yeah. 1. So there'll, there'll be there'll be there'll be one more interim story beat release, um, and then the the release after that will be 1.0, which will include the the Barathromite quest line. 
I have to say, and I won't, you know, do spoilers, but um, I really, like, I know vaguely, um, like, I have seen the new follow-up story um, after Tomb of the Eaters when you uh, you come back to Barathrum, and I yeah. was very much thrown for a loop. I, I really was expecting some kind of technological ascent, and uh, well, it was like... Well, it is kind of a technological ascent, <laughs> but, not, but not the one that you might naively believe, right? No, like... yeah. It's, I uh, I really had something in mind. I was like, okay, we're just going to do this. But of course it's cut and nothing is, uh, you know, the way you expect it to be. It had to be strange. And I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, don't, I just, we didn't feel like we could do the obvious thing. It would just be, it, it didn't, it didn't feel, it felt like too much of a mood change, right? Like it just, it, it and, and when we, when we landed on the solution that we landed on, it just felt right, right? It didn't feel like something we invented more than something we discovered that was what should actually be happening. We were like, oh, that's what should be, that, that's clearly what's happening. So I, um, I, you you may have already answered this, but I, I guess I'm, I'm just curious about this, is like, it does feel like a shift. Like it really does feel, and I know um, people who are watching this, if you're, you haven't gotten to the major story beat. I'm trying not to spoil, so it may be frustrating to not know what we're talking about. But um, for those who don't do know, I, I am seriously curious. Is it? It did feel like a pivot. Was so? Was that a genuine like y'all like pivoted away from something that was on paper always going to happen? No, I don't think so. We like when we when we we had never like really thoroughly plotted out what was going to happen post turn tomb of the eater so it would just kind of hang there for when we came back to it and when we finally sat down and said okay let's plot out the final pieces of the game and this was many years ago at this point but we said okay we're close enough this was basically when we were building tomb of the eaters um or like when we were designing it we said well we're close enough here let's really thoroughly plot out the the game to the very end um, when we did sit down and do that, the solution that we ended up with came out pretty quickly, um, a after talking through all the possibilities for what would happen. I don't, I don't, it, it's less of a pivot and more that when you just write the sketch of the thing on, on, on paper, which is what the first implementation of the quest is, you're just reading the, the incomplete sketch because we hadn't fin finished the plot of the game. Um, you get you get one read that sort of sets an expectation, but when we finally did do a complete design, what fell out was was basically there from the get go. In the first couple of days of discussion, we we settled on it. Okay, that's uh, that's that's really good. I um, I I was really like intrigued by that whole thing because like you know I've I've actually like over time like as I say I've, I've been, I'm kind of still new to cut in the grand scheme of things, but. Um, like I've had, you know, my own kind of theories about what stuff was, and I'm, all, I'm kind of like happy to always find out how wrong I am. Like it's just never, I'm never on the kind of the same wavelength. But um, that one was really funny to me. It was like, oh well, I mean, at least the the thing that I know for sure is going to happen is going to happen. No, yeah, no. In, in fact, it's it's far weirder than that. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's kind of like, that's what we want people to get out of CUD. That's what we want out of a game when we play. We want to not just be bombarded with our expectations, right? If you want that, we're going to go play some Lord of the Rings inspired fantasy game, right? Like that's what those kind of games are about, or just like sitting in a comfy zone, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Um, I love to do that. But Caves of CUD is about when you want something other than that. Right, because so many games serve the, the the sort of comfy expectation mode. Caves of Cud is different. It's not uncomfy, but it's not comf but it all of its comfiness doesn't come from familiarity. Right. Right. It's a it's a place where you sort of have to you come in feeling like an outsider and you you can grow some familiarity. It's not unwelcoming in its entirety once you understand the world right but it's it's something you have to in some ways earn 
Yeah, like, um, for instance, when you, the rusted archway is blocked off because you don't have a security card. Yeah. Uh, that's actually never happened to me before. Also, a uh, new one on me is I don't think I've ever seen such a lore cap before. Like, this is just a really good cap. Except for the rep with apes. That's kind of a bummer. Apes hate you. Apes hate me. But, I mean, it's a good cap for Bethesda Sousa, I suppose. For sure. Um, all right, let me see. How, okay, I had some... Okay, I have some, like, questions regarding lore, but I feel like most of those questions are going to be redacted, and I I don't honestly... Like, we could do them, and we could just confirm if they're redacted, and that's fine. Um, uh, yeah, we, we could. Uh, I will almost always say not address internal lore explicitly. I'll say that much. Okay. Um, <laughs> that covers most of these. Uh... Okay, let me, let me, I had a question here, but let me rephrase this question. Um, the, you know, the cut community is very, like, they very rapidly kind of dissects cud, And a lot of, like, I'll, I'll see a lot of theories float around. And um, I know cut is made with a philosophy of like, uh, you know, it's, it's open to interpretation, but um, some things are canonical. Maybe it's canonical, maybe it's not, but um, the the fun is in not knowing, maybe, or um, theorizing or um, puzzling things out. But, um, like, maybe, maybe you've seen that some people have, like, straight up just theorized what you had written on paper. Like... Yeah, you've you've seen the community kind of dissect your puzzle box or the team's puzzle box, and yeah. uh, so I guess the question I I want to you know without necessarily saying what it was, but is there any like big brain back pocket lore that no one has figured out yet? Uh, yeah, there there is. People people get pretty close to un to to unpacking all of the lore often um but i don't think anyone's posted a really complete set of suppositions that matches our own internal objective understanding of the lore um and a lot of the lore speculation is really wrong but some, but there, there, there are there are quite a lot of people who have a very good understanding of of the basis of the lore, um, and some people who are getting pretty close. But it's it's I would say it's not most people. It's um, not most people. Yeah, and and that may change a little bit once we finally put the capstone um, plot pieces on, which will allow people to finally connect some dots a little bit. Um, and decide on an interpretation and then unpack it a little more from that 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 way. We'll see. Um, but yeah, there, there's definitely there's 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 definitely not yet a quite complete understanding in inside the community of all of the major characters. Though there are some really good theories in the mix. I love that. I I, I like that's. I think that's like got to be the the dream for anyone making like some some kind of long form narrative is that you have. Oh, it's fun for me because I, I mean, this is mostly stuff that's constructed by Jason and Kaylin, and I'm pretty bad at interpreting it. So it's helpful for me to read other people's read of the lore because I'm not that great at the, the media analysis. And so often I'll get a. I'll, 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 it'll help my understanding of the texture of these characters to read it. Someone's good explanation of them, um, because I, you know, I'm just I'm just making the UI. I'm not I'm not writing the the deep lore, um, and so you know, my understanding of it is is also incomplete personally. So it's a, it's great fun for me to read the lore channels. It's helpful. It's helpful to me to understand my own game often. That's really cool. I I I like that. Like, 
I love the idea that you're 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 along for the ride. Um, is a really oh, I total cool. I totally am. I totally am. Um, like the 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 lore team doesn't interface with me completely. I obviously have <laughs> a pretty. I, I mean, I have a pretty good understanding. There's a lot of there's a lot of me in the world building or whatever. Mm. But like, it, it, especially like especially in the back half of the game where I'm I'm really heads down focused on the technical builds and the teams are starting to be big enough that they work separately. Um, some of the quests, like I just wasn't involved in at all, so it's it's novel to me. Um, like I like um, some of the later quests with the tree, and even some of the quests inside the Tomb of the Eaters were basically developed entirely um, without me, and so I got to engage with them sort of as a totally new player. And reading other people's interpretation, interesting. Your uh, Discord kind of put you in the waves there for a moment, but. Um... Oh, I, sorry about that. I, no, it's fine. I, 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 it's, it's, I, I love the idea that, like, well, I've, okay, so I've thought a little bit about this. This is going to seem like trite for a lot of people, but I think it's relevant in some ways. Is, um, there's been a really interesting kind of talking point about Rick and Morty, um, specifically regarding, like, the long form narrative or, like, the continuity. And something I, I, re a theory I really appreciate is that, um, someone basically just guessed correctly the entire show's premise um sure. the entire back pocket lore and um and like dan Harmon was just so pissed off that he's like well we're just gonna you know cross that out and then yeah <laughs> rewrite the so you, i, I do you see like the same, you see the same thing happen in like in 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 shows like westworld where you'll get a big like you get a big community that starts unpacking the lore um, and like the the showrunners seem to get irritated with that and make the and sort of get in this arms race with Reddit or whatever about trying to make the show so confusing that Reddit can't successfully unpack it. And like I don't think that's a particularly great game to get in because when you have ten billion people reading your lore, if none of them can guess what you're talking about like what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> right like like that's that's probably not a good outcome there there there's certainly there's certainly like places where the in, unending mystery is fun i don't want to say that but if your goal is to like build a compelling world the fact that it's understandable to some extent has to be a little bit of a goal um I'm just trying to figure out here if I can uninstall my carbide and reinstall full right. Oh yeah, I think I can. Because it carbide is taking up two points, so if I uninstall it, I'll have enough points. There you go. I just got a free upgrade for my hand bones. Very nice. That uh that is I, I have actually like oh, it's, it's a nice fist. None none of my like um metal like ex I I don't know what you want to call them handbone runs have ever played out to where to a point where I can actually upgrade them. I usually end the game with carbide handbones. Well, you're you're on a roll now. You got you got a serious endoskeleton going on. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, like I think that. Uh, I don't know if it's true, but I mean, like, I think people have theorized about um, Game of Thrones as well. That being the case, like, you know, people just kind of figured it out. And then I was like, well, can't can't do that. Can't make it that obvious if they can understand it. But yeah, I think the problem is that if you're competing with the single. The single most. Capable evaluator who's the most sort of lucky and making guesses about the lore where it's not clear you, you the only way you're gonna win that fight is by not having consistent lore basically right like right. otherwise someone is gonna be able to guess the outcome which i mean it's hard to write big consistent lore sometimes that's the answer you get into that in like tabletop games where a lot of times the game and its outcome in the lore is more about a conversation between the players and the dungeon master where the dungeon master is hearing what the players are talking about and going, oh, that's a good idea, right? Like, I didn't yeah. think about that. And then you, you sort of collaborate to build a, 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 a piece of lore that's mediated by a dungeon master, but not necessarily created by them, right? Right. Um, I think that... 
I find that to be a pretty compelling way to build a world. Um, I don't think we've done too much of that in Caves of Cud. Uh, like, I can't remember too many times when when we heard a player interpretation of the lore and said, oh, we're going to do that instead. I don't, I don't think that has happened. But I don't I don't have any disdain for that outcome either, right? Like, I think oftentimes the players are more involved in the lore of the world, inhabiting it, than the creators in a lot of ways. And I think that there's a lot of value in that kind of um, sort of respect for the player's experience in the world. There's just, there's a lot, there's a lot of ways to make games. There's a lot of ways to write stories. And I, you know, a lot of people get in the opinion that one of them is a better way. And that's, you know, I don't really feel that way. I think there's there's a lot of ways to make games. There's a lot of ways to write stories. Caves of Cut is one of them. It serves a particular way of building and a particular play style. But, you know, there's a lot of value in, dif in, in, in diversity of creation, right? Like, there's a lot of different player needs that are not solved by Caves of Cut. I think, I think um, one of these of credit is, is interesting as we solve like a very narrow niche that is not highly populated by other pieces of um, more than anything else. I think that that is its that is its boon is that it it's it serves a pretty unique niche. I think um, concerning like narrative and like people figuring it out. Uh, one of my favorite methods is just like, yeah, that's really good. And in fact, it's better than what I had in mind. But like, I'll just throw in one obstacle, like red herring to lead people away to think it's not that and then just like confirm it is that, <laughs> you know, just like a an, one extra little uh, red herring. Um, but uh, I think we're going to close this episode. I just reached Golgotha, so I think that's a good place to stop. Yep. And um, if uh, if you're enjoying our my talk with uh, Brian Bucklew, and uh, some of our deep lore stuff, then maybe you want to consider hitting the like button and subscribing for all of that and more. Any any closing uh, thoughts? And more. And yeah, more. Enjoy. Enjoy. <gasps> lore and more. Lore and more. That is a good, it's a good name for series. All right. I'll see you guys next time.